So there's a hierarchy to to laws, and uh, there's you know there's state law which 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 uh, uh, supersedes uh, corporate law, and uh, and then there's bylaws which are equivalent to a constitution. So then beneath bylaws are the rules of order. And I'm going to be talking about this, this hierarchy in the next couple of slides. Uh, the bylaws are written by your group. And what they do are they prescribe how the assembly functions, including all rules that the, the society considers important so that they do two things. They cannot be changed without a previous notice to the members and a vote of a, of a specified large majority, like two thirds, and they cannot be suspended. So you can suspend standing rules, but you cannot suspend bylaws. If anyone suggests suspending bylaws, they need to be escorted out of the room because they're not adding value. They are lying to you. <laughs> uh, but the bylaws are there to protect the membership on things that are, are uh, very important to you. Uh, and like John was saying, you can, you, can, you can describe in the bylaws what a quorum is. So the default is 50% um, uh, I mean, fifty percent of the people attending a meeting, they um, sometimes um, people specify quorums that are, cannot be attained, and then you get in a conundrum where you can't hold a viable meeting in order to change the quorum numbers in order to have a viable meeting. I'm I'm just sorry. That just made me laugh. I'm just wondering if Congress is stuck in that kind of loop right now. I don't. <laughs> Just, anyway, it's beyond physics. They're, they're, they're in a different rat cage. Yes, they are. So underneath, uh, underneath um, uh, bylaws are then rules of order, and they refer to written rules of parliamentary procedure formally adopted by an assembly, and such rules relate to the orderly transaction of business meetings. Um, and onto the next slide, there are actually two types of rules of order. Uh, there are, uh, there's a parliamentary authority like Robert's rules, and then there's special rules of order adopted by the assembly that supersede any rules in the parliamentary authority. And this is also a mouthful, but going back to what I was saying earlier, there are circumstances where you might want to, to tweak the, the basics of parliamentary procedure uh, so you're not taking of anyone's rights, but you're sort of make the, you're changing how they're they're executed. And a common one is uh, there are two common ones: is changing the order of business. Um, and this is on the next slide where we talk about exceptions. Uh, assemblies wish to establish their own order of business instead of the standard order of business that that Robert's rule specifies, uh, or there you commonly find rules relating to the length and number of speeches permitted to each member in debate. So the, the, the default is a maximum of two speeches per person per topic for no longer than 10 minutes. Um, 10 minutes is a long time for someone to speak. And so what you find is assemblies saying, you know, rather than have two for 10 minutes, why don't we have people up, allow people to three, speak for three minutes for a maximum of, of uh, three times, which would give you nine minutes of debate as opposed to uh, uh, 20 minutes of debate from each person. And that way you don't get these eternal meetings that people hate to attend because uh, uh, people are droning on. It's also important to establish the number of times people can speak because you often get two people very excited about a topic that the rest of the people in the room could care less about uh, and your your presiding officer needs to stop this. So either it's in the bylaws or you go to the default of no one's being able to speak more than twice on a topic. Going back to the previous discussion on when can a, a, uh, a credentials committee close down, uh, a committee cannot decide on itself to take away rights from the membership. Um, that is clearly stated in the bylaws. And if they try to do that, then you need to push back. Uh, the assembly, if a majority of the group decides that the credentials committee can close down, uh, they can do so, but it takes a two thirds majority and prior notice to do so. So, you know, hopefully that this is brought up uh, 
uh, properly and is debated. And and so the decision to make to to close down credentialing and close off anyone who arrives late from uh, uh, participating is done in a thoughtful manner. Uh, and as I said, we're going to have a future discussion about how you call BS on these kinds of actions and get it reversed. There's a couple of things you can do, um, but you you need to know your rights so you can push back. What I suspect currently happens in the two situations where I know this is going on, uh, people show up, they find out that they are not can't be credentialed and they can't uh, participate, and they say, screw this, I'm leaving and I'm going to go to the beach with my kids uh, because clearly these people don't want me here participating and I have better things to do with my time. That is the last thing that we need ha to have happen is people disengaging from the process because of BS rules like this. Just, just out of curiosity or at the, the top level, is bullshit like the McConnell rule or the 60 votes as opposed to two thirds? Is that are those exceptions that they've written in for their own good? They're, they're not exceptions. They're um, they're rules as they had had been written. So uh, especially in the case of McConnell, I mean, those those are rules, the Senate rules, which you often hear them talk about uh, in the news and them changing date back to, you know, what Thomas Jefferson set up. And there used to be the filibuster rules. Um, and, you know, we find that when it just gets too onerous to, uh, uh, for one party to let the minority party uh, participate, they change the rules to eliminate them. So the, the rules for confirmations used to be 60 votes, and now it's just a majority. Well, and, and I don't want to get too expanded on this. I'm just curious, like, where's the check and balance on House and Senate at the top changing the bylaws making up rules to basically do whatever is there any other part of government that gets nah is it the judicial that says you can't do that with bylaws or anything or does anybody get to do that with them they get to make up their own rules and i believe it's written into the constitution uh and what's interesting is the thing it just takes a majority vote at the beginning of the congressional session uh, when they adopt their rules to uh, to change things <clears throat> and you, you, we heard them referred to as nuclear options because when you start doing things like changing the 60 vote requirement for, um, for the lower courts, then that just flings open the, uh, the gates for the op opposing party to do that at, with the Supreme Court nominations, which is exactly what happened. So it used to be 60 votes for, uh, to confirm a Supreme Court nominee. Now it's 50 votes because the Republicans changed it. But so, but, did, but if we if the Democrats take power, we can use or abuse the same loophole. Is that basically what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And but knowing the Democrats, they'll close the loophole because they're nice, and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they're always known for playing fair and uh, never gaming the system. Well, certainly, That's not, their reputation. certainly not to any decent advantage. They're basically like, here, how can I run over my own foot again? Um, thanks, GOP. And just just curious. So there's really no way we we would have to put people in office that create stricter rules on themselves. Right. Or find a way. I mean, that's just what frightens me is that there just doesn't seem to be a lot of a checks and balance on that whole thing there. Like that should could could we? Have, I guess my question you can move on is: could, Can we could we have a rule that says if the if the Congress just tr tried to implement some new bylaw that really made it easier for them to do something bad or wrong, it would require a national vote of the people or something like that? That would be a violation of the Constitution, which then would go to the Supreme Court. But just their procedural rules, you know, if they're following. Uh, the basic uh, procedural rules of parliamentary procedure, like a majority vote, uh, makes the decisions, which we just discussed, then they're certainly operating within their um, uh, legally. And what's what's what what's what whether it's right or not is a different different discussion. You know, there must have been a reason why they wanted 60 votes for a confirmation originally. Um, uh, it just became inconvenient to have that. Um, Inconvenient. Uh, you know, even even the 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 them not following through with even giving Merrick Garland the hearing uh, when Obama tried to fill the Supreme Court seat. You know that 
that wasn't a violation of any rule. There was nothing forcing them. There was nothing in the Constitution that said that within a certain amount of time, you had to fill that seat. And so even though everyone knew there was egregious behavior, there was nothing illegal going on there. If they had written in the Constitution that, that they have to advise and consent within six months, um, then that would have been a different situation. So I just want to bring it back around to what the point about this is, and then you can move on. It sounds like if we want to make sure the rules don't get changed, we have to be very careful about who we put in those positions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who we elect, right? That's just anyway. And, you know, not to get too far down the f- out of the out of the ballpark on this but you know we do have an elected majority of republicans in both houses right now and allegedly that they're representing a majority of the will of the people of the united states of america whether that's correct uh, because of all the gerrymandering and voter suppression going on then that that's up to debate and we really need to fix the underlying processes so that we actually have people that we elect representing a will of the majority I don't think we have that now. And, you know, yeah, we have a president that did not get a majority vote either. And look what he's doing to the country. Right. That's that's what I'm trying to say. If we don't want those positions of power, they get abused. So, all right. So I took it up your time. So the slide on special rules. Uh, so there, this was a concept that was hard for me to grasp for a long time. But I think I finally get it now. There's standard there's standard rules and there's special rules. Special rules are. Uh, when you curtail people's rights. So allowing the credentials committee to shut down is curtailing people's rights. And they must be adopted by either a previous notice and two thirds vote or a majority of the entire membership. So if you have an entire membership of a thousand people and typically only 75 show up for a meeting to pass a special rule, it would either have to be previous notice and two thirds vote of those attending the meeting or a majority of the entire membership, which, you know, if you had a 900 people that never showed up to a meeting, it would be kind of hard to attain. Huh. We have a, we have 13 people here. Hi, all 13 of you. And I think we have enough for a quorum, Larry. <laughs> um, so standing rules then are, uh, are really to address administration rather than a parliamentary procedure. They can be changed as any ordinary act of a society. So a standing rule can be adopted by a majority vote without previous notice, and they can be suspended. So uh, a good one on this, you know, uh, hopefully you did not bake into your bylaws that meetings have to adjourn at 9.30 p.m. And those were in your standing rules. And so, you know, you have a lot of business that you have to accomplish, you know, you're not going to get it all done by 930. You have a standing rule that says you have to adjourn at 930. You can, by a majority vote, say, uh, we, I move to uh, suspend the rules uh, so we can continue and, uh, meeting until we finish the business. And you end up having to do that every time if the meeting runs over, right? So that's a dumb rule. <laughs> I see where you It you're... is. Yeah. But, you know, there's there's group we have groups that operate like that. And and so there's this big rush to get, you know, to rush through uh, getting business done. And and people are finding them their their ability to speak and participate in the meetings are being curtailed just because they want to get the meeting over with. And that's where you have to know your rights to object to those kinds of things so that a majority of the group has to agree to what's what's going on. We have another uh, circumstance where the rules committee uh, is typically scheduled for one hour uh, and more recently has been scheduled for an hour and a half. And when the hour and a half is done, the staff comes in and says, oh, you got to get out of the room. Everyone stands up and walks out without ever agreeing to having to (laughs) adjourn the meeting. Yeah, you talked about this last time. I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? It's, It's appalling. Uh, but we've done it for so many years that people are just accustomed to doing it. And, you know, the staff says, oh, there's another group. They're standing outside uh, uh, waiting to come in. you got to get out of the room. We need to vacate the room. It's like, you know, your inability to schedule rooms properly is not our problem. Sorry. <laughs> Pathetic. So uh, underly- underlying everything are, is the concept of customs. And there's been some interesting debates on customs recently. So these are things that you have 
that are practices that have come to be followed as if they were prescribed by rule. And so, like in the case of um, Astoria City Council that doesn't have rules of order, it might be that they have tabled things in the past. And even though that's not a recognized rule, they have all acknowledged that that is a common practice and that they're, 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 they're going to honor that procedure and allow things to be tabled. And so that's a custom if it's not written down. Um, and so what Robert's Rule says is established customs sh should be adhered to unless the assembly decides to do otherwise. And if a custom becomes a conflict with the parliamentary authority, a point of order can be raised and the custom can be abandoned. So in the case of the Rules Committee, where the custom is to stand up and walk out <laughs> of the meeting, uh, <laughs> even though it's not been adjourned, uh, any of us could have said point of order uh, we have not properly adjourned this meeting and yanked it back. Nice.